So I'm going to say a name, Darren, and just say what comes to mind, and that's uh, Jace and the Wheeled Warriors. Oh, wow. Jace and the Wheeled Warriors. <laughs> oh, wow. Jace and the Wheeled Warriors, 1985, turning 20. Darren gets cast as the title voice of a cartoon series uh, that Mattel was uh, the, the big player behind it, and a company called Deke, D I C. Something, something in Shalapan. I can't remember the two other names. Um, but uh, Deke uh, decided to come up to. They, oh, they did a they did a nationwide American and Canadian search for the care for the actor who was going to voice Jace, and I got cast as Jace. <laughs> and uh, here's I, what comes to mind: is uh, they fired me after the first two episodes. I'm going to give you a story. So they cast me and I was so, like I was, and if you listen to the first, like you can go online, I believe, because I have an almost nine-year-old daughter who I played it for a couple of years ago. And it's interesting because she loved it. And it's, I look at it now and it seems slightly dated. I know it was like this sort of cult cartoon yeah. classic. And so I got cast and I was very enthusiastic and I had done a ton of voice work. That was how I started in Toronto. For whatever reason, I did a lot of commercials and a lot of voice work. I could read very well, and I was very game and enthusiastic. So they they decided to do the show up in Toronto. They recorded the voices, and there were some great actors on it. I mean, I don't know, Len Carlson, who played Herc, was like one of the great, great voiceover actors, right up there with Mel Blanc, um, Dan Hennessy, John Stalker, Luba Goy. I'm trying to think of... Uh, of some of the actors, great voice actors. So they cast me and uh, they didn't like how Canadian I sounded. You know, Canadians, I said, sorry, and mum, and out, out, get out of the house. Get out of the, I can't even do it now because I live in the States for so long. <laughs> mum, I'm going out of the house. I'm sorry, I have to get a dollar, right? And so they fired, they fired me and my agent who was amazing. Her name was Rhonda Cooper. She's She's no, she's retired now, but she was my agent at the time. And and Doris, oh my gosh, I can't remember Doris's last name. She was my voice agent. She scared the shit out of me. <laughs> Doris, this is the best. Doris was like this. She, oh God, Tracy Ullman does this. Do you know Tracy Ullman, the Tracy yeah. Ullman show? She used to do this character. I can't remember the character's name, Betty or something. Who was this? She was a, a makeup artist, an old Hollywood makeup artist. And there was always a cigarette dangling out of her mouth with the like with the um the ash, like just hanging. Anyway, Doris would be like, yeah, Darren, you got a booking. You're gonna play this character named Jace. And she sounded like she sounded like, I don't know, like B. Arthur meets, you know, uh, Brenda Vaccaro meets <laughs> Right. Anyway, so and she scared me. And so I, I would go, OK, Doris. OK, whatever. Anyway, Doris called me. She goes, hey, listen, kid, they want to fire you, but I'm going to get you paid for the whole series. And she says, I said, I don't want to get paid for the series. I want to do the series. <laughs> well, what do you want me to do? They, they don't like you. They think you sound too Canadian. I said, tell them I'll learn how to sound American. Can they can they find me a teacher? And I was I was 19. I was just turned 20. And um, they brought a guy. From New York, Stuart Rosen, Stu Rosen, multi Emmy award winning children's TV director turned animation director. Mm. They flew Stu Rosen up from LA and Stu and I hit it off. And he said to me, you're going to bust your ass, but I'm going to save you this job. So he would take the script. He'd come up five days before the first I want to say 10 episodes. They flew them up. They, I mean, they lavish amounts of money back then. And remember, nothing was remote. You couldn't patch people in. Like if you wanted a director to come up from LA, you had to fly him up. And he would stay at the Four Seasons Hotel in Toronto. I'll never forget. And I'd go over and we'd sit down and he would take out my script and he would take, he'd say to me, okay, he'd say, uh, say out. And I'd go, oh, and he'd say, say out. And I'd go, oh, oh. And he'd say, no, it's out. And he'd say, say, ouch. And I went, ouch. And he said, say, couch. And I said, couch. He said, say, cout. And I said, cout. He said, now say, out. And I go, out. And he go, there it is. That's it. <laughs> and he'd say the same thing with sorry. Say, sorry. 
And he'd give me, and he would take a pencil and he marked every single word that I sounded too Canadian. And I busted my ass and I, and he saved the job for me, Stu Rosen. I don't know if he's still around, but he was, and not only was he, he saved me that job, which was a huge deal for my career, which set me up for a lot of things financially in early in the early stages unfortunately i you know it was it was i was young and i and i i did okay out the gate sometimes i say it was bad that i did so well out the gate because for all the years i didn't do well i thought it was always going to be that way um but they brought me down to la and here's another jason in the world we're uh, wheeled warriors that you probably don't know oh god i wish i had the pictures to show you <laughs> i'm going to find them and i'm going to email them to you they decided that they liked me enough to consider doing the live action version. So they flew me. I mean, imagine this, 20 years old, um, a Toronto boy, you know, who had dreamed of, you know, working in television and film. And they flew me out to Los Angeles. Um, and actually, this is crazy. God, all things lead back to the century uh, Century City, where the Schubert Theater was, where I said I was going to be an actor, where I did Sunset Boulevard with Glenn Close. They put me up in the hotel, the Century Plaza, which is right across the street from it. And they had me go to um, Lucas. George Lucas's studios had something to do with where they costumed me. They built me a costume, made me a wig that looked like Jace. I don't know if you remember, but he had yeah. a white stripe through his hair like his father. I had my ring of light, which was this beautiful red stone. Um, I'll give you the cry in a minute, ring of light. And they tested me in a live event with kids to see how the kids liked me. And I don't know why it never happened, but it never happened. <sighs> That's depressing to people my age. Up until I can't remember, and I wish I still had them. I had all the toys. Did you have the toys, the armed forces? And like, I had all the Mattel toys, I had all of that stuff. It was the coolest thing in the world. It really was the coolest thing. And then I did all these voice commercials for Mattel as the voice of Jace. Like, it was really an exciting, very exciting beginning for me. And I, I don't discount it at all sometimes i look back and i listen to the first five episodes and i go i think oh my god you were so terrible <laughs> it was so terrible but they hung out they 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 stuck they stuck it out and they they hung in with me and and uh and then i did another series for them called cops officer hardtop <laughs> uh, jason the wheeled warriors ring of light magic might <laughs> <laughs> here's something interesting you know not to get too into my, because I don't really bring my personal stuff in, but it was a boy in search of his father. And I was a kid who, although I had an extraordinary father who my mother remarried and I, you know, he became my father. My mother and my, you know, my dad split when I was a kid. And, and I think I was very sensitive to that. My dad moved away to Florida and I lived in Toronto. And I think that as a kid, like there was definitively something about a boy yearning for his father's for connection with his father that I related to. And I think I, I think maybe I didn't know enough about that then, but I think maybe that's part of why they liked my voice. Gotcha. Now, now with those recording sessions, was it always just you in the booth? Was there ever any like communal recordings back then? It was. Now, this is an amazing thing as well. So the only person they they um, recorded separately uh, was Flora, was the mm -hmm. little girl. So, uh, but everyone else, and this is so not done anymore. Is animation is generally done one person in the booth at a time jason the wild warriors thankfully was done like a radio show oh, so we did everything in the same room and it was un. i'm i'm gonna tell you one of the reasons why i got pretty good at it was that i had the chance as a young young actor to be in the room with some great voiceover artists and they were so helpful to me so, yeah, I mean, you re-punch in lines here and there, especially you have to sometimes go in at, because we, so we would record the sessions. They would show us storyboards 
They would animate to our voices. And then sometimes if something didn't work, they would animate a line and then we'd have to go in and ADR it. We'd have to mm. go in, and, which was great too, because as a predominantly, I'm predominantly a television actor now. I mean, I, and film actor, but I, I work in television a lot and I dread, I dread ADR. I don't like going in and redubbing my voice. I'm just one of those actors who doesn't like mm. when I hear that. Chino loves it. And sometimes he loves to go in and redo his entire performance. I'm just not that guy. Um, but I'm good at it. And I'm good at it because of Jason the World Warriors in 1980. <laughs>